John chapter 14. Uh, before we read, I'm going to go into prayer. Um, Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be upon me, be in me, Father, and come out through me, God, that the scriptures would be taught in an orderly fashion, that they would understand. God, use me as a vessel. Give me boldness. Give me power. Give me knowledge and understanding to speak your word. And let it be always through love. And we give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Starting chapter first, uh, chapter 14, verse 1. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Uh, Jesus had just um, started talking to his disciples about this concept about him going to heaven and preparing a place for them. And uh, he says in 4, whither I go, you know, in the way, you know. And I always love this scripture because it gives us such hope. Because it lets us know that even though Jesus is the master teacher, the disciples, they just wasn't getting it. They have been walking with him for a good time now. But as we're going to see here, the disciples, they, they're just kind of clueless right now. And uh, when Jesus comes back to life, then they'll finally understand. But right here, we get a question from Thomas after Jesus had just given us this awesome statement. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? So he asks this question, and, and Jesus always talks sort of in, in shadows, because he's wanting to reveal himself, but after he dies on the cross, and the fullness of the New Testament is completed, we get the full revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus kind of talks to him here in a way that, well, you would think he would understand, but he just doesn't. And Jesus says um, in verse 6, he said, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh, to me, cometh unto the Father but by me. Um, this scripture is one of the most known scriptures in Christianity. Um, sometimes I think we glance over it a little bit. It, it really has particular and special meaning um, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That Jesus is not only the way, but he's also truth and life. Um, and a lot of times when people um, preach this scripture, they kind of focus more on, okay, Jesus is the only way in the sense that all other religions can't lead to God, which I absolutely believe. But now in, in our society, um, in the West, we kind of have this thought where Jesus, we kind of know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But then through Jesus, we want to make other ways to get to him. Um, and the Bible speaks about this continually. It's, it's the concept of grace versus works. Grace means um, something that we don't deserve. Grace is God's special favor to man. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with our works. And then works is our acts of morality, things that we think that we could do that would please God. Um, and works simply won't get you to heaven. Um, Amen. We, I'll come back to that in a second. If we read on a little further, um, now... Thomas wasn't the only one that didn't understand. Now we get a question from Philip. Philip saith unto him, Lord, shew us, shew us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet have thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Shew us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Um, so we have Philip here, and uh, we know Thomas is the one that doubted, but Philip here, he's doubting um, whether or not Jesus is God. I mean, Jesus has come to him, and he's, he's definitely been walking. We're in chapter 14 now. He's obviously been walking with them for a pretty good amount of time, and uh, he's still not getting, he still doesn't quite believe. And of course, until the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in them, they won't be able to fully believe as we do as believers now. Um, if you flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. Um, the book of James, um, summing it up, basically says, Talk is cheap. And uh, Jesus knew that. And Jesus said, you don't have to believe me by what I'm saying. Believe me by the works that I do. He was healing the blind, raising the dead. Um, but the most awesome thing that he was going to do, we'll read in um, chapter 15, 
of Corinthians. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also are you saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. In understanding the gospel, you can't get it backwards. Um, in our society today, we want to say, be as good as you can and come to God. But God, God flips it around. He says, look, um, I've given you the old covenant which says, do what I command you and I will be your God. But the Israelites showed us that we can't do that. It's not possible. The Israelites failed in every single way. So in Jeremiah, we get this concept. He said, you know what? I'm going to make a new covenant. Not that God didn't know that there was going to be a new covenant. Because he did, but he established the old so he could show us the new. And he made this new covenant which said, you know what? It's not going to be about what you do. He said, you will be my people. I will be your God. The only stipulation is faith. And you see, you see it all the way back in Abraham's time when he made the covenant to Abraham. And he said that the only requirement was to be circumcision. Now, of course, this was circumcision of the flesh. But now when we enter this covenant of God's faith, it's through the circumcision of our heart. And we need to understand that. James 2 and 18, um, a very interesting concept. Um, he's talking to the people and he says, Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So, okay, we got the gospel. We got that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was literally, he paid the penalty for our sins. Uh, there's a concept going around about the atonement that Jesus had to die for our sins so that he could satisfy Satan's demand on sin. But we have such a high concept of Satan. You see, it has nothing to do with Satan. Satan is nearly God's pawn. He does what God allows him to do. You see, God actually required that a sacrifice be made. It had nothing to do with Satan. God required that a penalty be paid for sin because even though God is loving, even though God loves everyone in the world, He has to punish sin because He is a good and just God. Um, that's why He sent Jesus. Um, it says in the scriptures that it pleased God to crush Jesus because Jesus had all the weight of our sin upon Him. In 2 Corinthians, um, it says He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And I think it's... Uh, Important that we understand that. So not only his death, but it says his burial. And it's important to know this because the Jews made up a lie to say that he actually wasn't dead, but that God sort of carried him away off the cross. And, and that's a concept going on all around the world. But it's simply not true. The Bible says he died for our sins and then he was buried. And then one of the most important aspects of Salvation is that Jesus actually rose from the dead because if he didn't rise from the dead, he would have died in vain, as Paul says in the scriptures. And, um, and his resurrection was, in a sense, a way to prove what he had done. Like he said, don't believe me because I say it, but believe me for the very work's sake. And uh, just, just in explaining the gospel, I just want to let you guys know um, about this whole thing, grace versus works. Just remove works completely from this salvation thing. God is calling us to a relationship with Him that's not about our good deeds. Um, it's about simply God calling us to faith in what He has done. Jesus paid a price that we could never pay. Um, and we have to stand in gratitude towards this and receive this by faith. Um, if you get grace and works backwards, you'll never be saved. Because when you think that you have to be good enough to come to God, you'll never get there. There's always going to be something that Satan is going to throw in your way. You might, uh, you might lie a lot, and then you might clean up a little bit, and now you're not telling lies anymore. Um, you might tell one or two here and there. But, and, and you think that somehow you're earning God's favor. But God said on your best day, your righteousness is as filthy rags. It's nothing. It's it's almost sickening before him. But Jesus, who paid the penalty for our sins, his righteousness is glorious. And uh, one of the best things that I think about the gospel is that God, not only when we receive him by faith, when we receive his death, burial, and resurrection, 
he doesn't just say you are forgiven. Like, like he doesn't just say 